Would you please help me in welcoming Dr. Tate? Thank you, Amber. You did a good job. Those were <laughs> those are pretty tough. Um, that, those are tough. You got Malincrod right, so that's that's big points. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So. I'm super excited. Again, this is a privilege to just be on the same uh, call with both of you gentlemen. Um, again, Dr. Tate, we are super excited uh, to have you and to have this conversation with you. Thank you for taking the time to speak directly to Black alumni at the University of South Carolina. I know so much of your time is devoted to faculty and staff and students especially, uh, so we really appreciate it. And uh, Rick, I will turn the conversation over to you. Um, Thank you so much, Amber, and for your leadership at the Black Alumni Council and to all of the alums and students and faculty uh, who are part of this conversation, uh, family and friends of the U of South Carolina. Uh, welcome and, and, and thank you for being a part of this conversation, this leadership series. D Dr. Tate, welcome uh, to all of us uh, who are alums, uh, certainly from the University of South Carolina. Welcome to our family. And let, let's just jump right in. Uh, you know, the reality is you are uh, the first black provost at the University of South Carolina, and, and I believe one of the first in the SEC. Uh, one, what, what is the provost? What does the provost do? Let's start there. Yeah, so you no, know, I am the first, so you all get credit for appointing the first. Uh, don't give it to anybody else. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to thank Amber, and also I appreciate an opportunity to talk to a distinguished alum from the University of South Carolina. Thank you for serving. Um, the provost fundamentally at, at, at the University of South Carolina also has the title of you know, the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. In essence, um, if you think about the mission of the university is teaching, research, and service, the provost is fundamentally responsible for teaching the research aspects that deal with graduate students and the like, that, that portfolio also falls in our um, set of responsibilities. And if you think about community engagement as part of service, that also happens in academic affairs. So in essence, the provost is, touches every aspect of the university's uh, operation, from the library to the classrooms, um, to anything that just deals with the academic enterprise. Generally speaking, the provost is responsible for the university when the president is away. You're usually the number two person on campus. That's the way this model is set up. And so if the president is out of town, I'm responsible for the operation, um, along with many others, but fundamentally you, you're, the, you're the lead point person. So it's usually the number, considered the number two spot on campus and um, just you, you just have to make things go. I, I look at it, um, it, there's actually a church related definition of provost, but the, the way I would describe it is you, your job is to make the engine go. You just, you have to make the university go. That's really what it's about. Well, it's an incredibly important role having worked at the university and administration. So again, we thank you. We welcome you to this. Let, let me go to something. I want to come back to provost, but uh, the, you know, the most pressing issue right now, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, we're confronted with it all across America. Uh, recognizing the disproportionate impact on uh, black and brown people of color. Uh, the university is open. Uh, we all have been watching the data, the numbers. Where are we now and what's the path forward? How are we managing? How are we doing with regards to COVID-19 and its impact on the university campus and system? Well, I I'm going to tell you because I had the uh, pleasure of um, segueing in the middle of a pandemic um, from one university to another and then jumping on the planning and execution process here. Um, I, I, I said from the beginning uh, to anybody who listened, I thought the planning process to reopen the University of South Carolina was elite. Um, most recently, the federal government came down to take a look at us because we're one of the only universities to open that didn't have a massive medical center, uh, you know, aka um, Michigan, aka Wisconsin or where I was at Wash U, um, we have a smaller medical school with a school of pharmacy and, and public health. And those individuals have done an outstanding job of framing a return strategy um, that really is worthy of replication across the country. I, I, I think that the University of South Carolina has uh, done an outstanding job. I couldn't be prouder to be with a group of people that I'm working with right now. Um, the metrics and the like you see in real time um, right now, they're looking good. This changes um, regularly because we're putting new data in all the time. Um, we're going to uh, ramp testing back up again over the next uh, seven to 14 days. Um, my hope is um, 
And what I would expect, I'm an epidemiologist, so what I would expect to see is that as we ramp the testing up, we'll have a, we'll have a, a bit of an uptick and then uh, behavior changes with reporting of information. And then you, it'll, it'll start to go down. And uh, by that time, I'm hopeful we'll be at Thanksgiving and have completed the semester and be planning for number two. So that's the end game. Um, we haven't had, we've been checking for disparities. You mentioned that. There hasn't been any, dis, you know, any disparities mentioned and uh, we found in terms of health related things. In fact, only I think three to four students have had to go to the hospital, mostly because their parents wanted them to be checked, but they, had, they were immediately released. So we've been very fortunate. Um, nothing um, has happened uh, that would be you know, considered traumatic. And I, I, I take that um, a serious matter because the infrastructure here for student health is outstanding and it's really been going very well. So you should, you should be proud as an alumnus. This, this was not an easy feat. And uh, while we're in the midst of it, it's still September. Um, I, can, I can say the heavy lift is going really well right now. And um, we're just gonna keep pushing and make sure see if we can make it to the end. The number one thing, and I want to say this, the behavior of the students, you know, I expect 18 to 22 year olds to act a certain way. And, um, but it's been pretty solid. And um, we, we just want to be able to make it so that they don't, you know, they can have a regular college experience as regular can be in a pandemic. That's, that's really what yeah. the aim is. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for that, because I imagine you bring some comfort to alums who uh, are obviously concerned and may have uh, children themselves. I know you have two kids, if I, were, if I, I believe is correct, who are college uh, yes. students at the moment. So not only do you bring the perspective of your experience in epidemiology, but as a parent. So that gives us a lot of comfort. Yeah, I'm, my daughter sends me a text um, every time she gets a negative test for the COVID. She's our re resident assistant, so she's really working with students. So she takes them weekly, and she's like, "I'm good, I'm good, I'm okay." You want to hear that? I mean, that's that's what, as a parent, you want to you want to know they're safe. Right, right. Well, let, let's go back to. Uh, thank you for that. Let's go back to to, to provost. Listen, the, the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, we all watched the process play out. Uh, the search for uh, the University of South Carolina president. I've had the pleasure to get to know President uh, Caslin. You were a, a candidate, a contender uh, for the presidency of the university. Uh, you now are in a very significant role as provost. Uh, any insight from that experience? How does it feel now? I mean, you, you were in the running. You were in the top tier uh, and almost made it. Just curious, any thoughts and reflections there? Yeah, I'm an athlete. I don't like to lose, but, you know, um, the, but, 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 but seriously, you know, I probably wouldn't be here as provost if I hadn't gone through the process. So I want you to reflect on it a moment. The process starts, you know, we're in the final four people. Um, I get to meet a lot of individuals on this campus through that process. Um, trustee members, student leaders, faculty and staff. And um, I, I left the process when I left Columbia. I didn't think I was ever going to be back but I left the process with a positive feeling about the people. So I, I really enjoy working with the students that were on those committees. I really enjoy talking to the faculty and the staff here. It was extremely positive uh, engagement. I was very sad. I, you know, my wife had to come down for that as well. And we left sad. We were like, that was, there was really some awesome folks. And we thought, you know, we could be devoting our lives to the institution. And, I go back to Washington University and I think, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm Dean here and I've been here 18 years. I love the place and I'm going to keep working. Lo and behold, I get a phone call, um, you know, about being provost. And, you know, honestly, Rick, I, I told him, no, I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. You've selected a person and I don't want to get in the way of them leading. It's not like a competition, you know, directly where we're on the athletic field competing against each other. I don't, I didn't know any of the candidates. So I had no ill will towards anyone, you know, we, they, hadn't, they hadn't elbowed me or you know, hit me upside my head. So <laughs> my bottom line was I, I, I wanted to be respectful. And so I just said, you know, he should be able to pick his own person. They continued to encourage me to stay in the process. I did. And then when I met face to face with the president, you know, I asked him point blank, you know, do you think I could be a help to you in this context? And he thought he, he said yes. And then we worked out a way to make that happen um, through the, through the search process and ultimately over the, over the last few months on how we we're gonna to partner to try to move the institution forward. So 
it's been great and I've really enjoyed it. Um, it you know, it's been delightful uh, working with him actually. Well, President Kaslin uh, uh, refers to you, and I quote, a game changer. Uh, obviously, uh, there are challenges. Uh, there have been challenges at the university, as in uh, most institutions. Uh, any unique challenges that, that you've already uh, been confronted with uh, and anything we've learned already? Well, um, planning for a pandemic in real time in executing that is, <laughs> okay, so if, in March I was offered this job. If you had told me we were gonna be in this state now, I might, I would have been like, I'm staying in St. Louis. I mean, mm -hmm. no, I'm just teasing, but you know, this is as big a task as you can get because you have to basically up, up, have an upload of a testing program, a public health program, a patient care program, while running an academic program and a research endeavor and the traditional co-curriculars that students are expected. I heard you say you were in Omega Sci-Fi. So people want to hear about those organizations. They want to be in the fraternity life and sorority life. And, you know, all those things have to keep going. And then, so, and each one needs its own COVID related plan. Mm. Each entity. So you think about anything you experienced in college, every single one of those has to have their own plan in order for them to stay alive. That's the level of detail and work you have to do to make this happen. This is unprecedented. So that's why you see many people say, we're going virtual. We don't want any students on campus. Student life is shut down. We're only going to provide you uh, basically what we're doing right now, a Zoom feed. And because it's the more straightforward way of doing it. But, but we basically have said, we want our students to have a South Carolina experience. And that includes athletics, that includes fraternity life, sorority life, that includes all of Greek life, that includes the totality of the enterprise because this is how you grow and learn and develop as a human being. And so, yeah, that's the challenge, you know, um, and your thoughts and prayers for us because we wanna make it happen for you all. I mean, I mean, I know you're alums, but the future alums, we really want them to leave and, and say that was a great experience. That wasn't some COVID experience. And, um, and I think that's the key, you know, for me in my mind that I, I have every day. It wakes me up every morning. How can I make this more like my experience was in college? Right, right. You know, there's been this interesting, I guess, uh, conversation over years uh, uh, about the enrollment of Black students, um, accessible uh, education, quality education at USC, uh, decline in Black student enrollment, which perhaps may be a tuition cost issue, uh, this sort of interesting uh, juxtaposition of how many in-state students versus out-of-state students. Where are we with Black student enrollment? I think I read somewhere that we might have grown by some 28% over last year. So that sort of debunks that. How are we doing with Black student enrollment? At U so U last, this year's freshman enrollment, first year enrollment was about 470. That is up 28% from last year's 367. That's a great start. Um, that's 8% of the freshman class was basically African-Americans, labeled African-Americans and Blacks. Overall, the undergraduate population is 9% Black right now. Um, that's up 5% over last year, year to date, um, just overall. So there's a, the trend line is positive. Um, the concern, and I think you, you, you laid it out um, really very well, is that um, some, some things will depend on in-state and out-of-state out ratios. Uh, most of this, sir, really depends on scholarship money. So in the end, um, if we want to continue the trend that we're on, if we look at the demography in the state of South Carolina, um, the number or percentage of African-Americans graduating from high school the, the number is going down, not the, that we're getting, uh, having smaller and smaller numbers of African-Americans in our demo, in, in the demographic. And so for us to continue to recruit like this, we're going to have to be in, begin to recruit students who heretofore may not have been able at the same rates be able to pay the full freight. That means we need more scholarship money in order to bring students on and give them the opportunity. So a big, a big thing that we're working on right now is working with the state legislature to free up from a policy perspective, some of the money we 
we already get from tuition that they have a cap on that in terms of how much we can use for, to, for tuition scholarships. We're just asking the, the state to let us use our own money to give these students who are worthy of an opportunity to study here scholarships to increase that number. If we can pull that off over this legislative session, that will be a huge win for us and it will allow us to continue the momentum that has been, uh, that we just talked about over this past year. Do, do you think that there should be some, if any, I guess, uh, aspirational goal? Uh, I think I heard uh, uh, President Kaslin talking about, you know, maybe the black student enrollment should be in alignment or commiserate with the black population of South Carolina. Any, I mean, wh what's sort of the goal? Or should that's there be an aspirational goal? He, yeah, so, you know, that's pretty bold. I mean, I got to tell him. That's very bold. So he, he laid out that, 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 that the numbers should be proportional to the representation in the state. So it is a goal, it's a lofty goal, and we, we're going to have to fight to do it. But I think it's worthy of the fight. You know, to get there, sir, we really, it, it is, it's, it's, it's almost 100% financial. So we have to raise money um, at, for scholarships to make sure that we can continue to uh, compete. The, the top students in the state have other opportunities. Now, we remain the number one producer of African Americans with undergraduate degrees within the state. But other, you know, other states are not sitting still. They see our talent. You, know, you, you can go to North Carolina or, or others who have maybe have a higher financial aid threshold, and, and they're getting opportunities there. I want all the kids here to have an opportunity to go to college in the state. Of course, I would prefer them to stay with us. But for us to make that happen, we have to get more money in our system for scholarships. I mean, I would say it over and over again, we've got to double down on raising money from scholarships from, from folks who may be on this call, as well as our state government folks, because that's the way we can continue to grow. We really have to uh, invest in ourselves and say that this is important. And I want to give to the University of South Carolina for so some people like me, the versions of me that are coming along now have a shot at it. And so I think that's what we really have to do and double down on very hard. Yeah. You know, uh, let's turn just a moment because I'd love to get your thoughts in addition to students. Uh, black faculty, staff, uh, you know, this has been an, an ongoing conversation for years. Uh, back in the 90s, we created what was called a five point plan to sort of give some framework to how do we improve now the word we use today is diversity. How are we doing with regards to black faculty and staff? I know you can't control the staff. Uh, that's not in your portfolio, but certainly on the faculty side. Uh, how are we and where are we headed with well, regards to faculty? Um, from my perspective, um, we have a lot of work to do. So I, I think we, we need to double down on our efforts uh, on this front. We have many talented um, black faculty members here um, who are doing really outstanding scholarship and teaching and, and service. But if you think about where we are, um, this, is, this is South Carolina. And um, if you think historically, um, you know, we, we, I see some people in the chat talking about Richard Greener and, and the like, the first African-American faculty member here, who was, by the way, I just finished a book about him, uh, outstanding in terms of as being intellectual and setting a model for, for those of us who follow, um, we need more of that. Um, I think if we say we want to increase the number of African-American students, it's imperative that they have um, some examples to see and some people to engage with. And, you know, the example metaphor works for me in part, um, but it's not, you know, and I hope, I hope my Black alumni colleagues don't take this the wrong way. It's not just for you. You know, these white individuals who matriculate here need to see black faculty as well, who are excellent. And because there are many, many outstanding black faculty who can contribute intellectually to their development uh, on many fronts from, from the sciences and engineering and the laboratory environments to the social sciences, to the humanities, it's imperative that you begin to engage with people about their ideas and training who are very different from yourself. So it's a value added, not just for African-American students, but for the totality of our enterprise, we need this desperately. And so I think we've got to double down on it. It's in the strategic plan for us to uh, 
put together an operational strategy to help increase that from a financial point of view and also from a hiring point of view. So we're going to be working on that. Well, that, that's good to hear. And, you know, the other point of that, uh, Dr. Tate, is that extends into the community as well. You know, I don't know if you can see behind me, but I have a, a, one of my favorite paintings or, or portraits I found from the archives of the university many years ago. Uh, a portrait of the first black teachers educated at the University of South Carolina in 1860s. So, you know, the, the reality is that the university, particularly because of our system, we can help solve for some of the challenges and problems and inequalities in the state of South Carolina, whether they're disparities in health or in education, producing teachers to teach in our public school system. But does the university think, or I mean, I imagine we, we are working towards how do we not only make this experience meaningful for students, but for faculty and the impact that we can have on the people of South Carolina? Well, that's what it means to be the flagship. So right. day, day one for me um, here, you know, we call it, I call it flagshipping in the provost's office. Um, wherever we can, we want to make a difference in the lives of the people of South Carolina. You mentioned that, you know, Amber mentioned that I was at the University of Wisconsin the, and the Wisconsin idea was that everything that the University of Wisconsin did would impact the lives of the community in the state of Wisconsin. I bring that mindset to this. I think that, and you know, I've talked to some faculty in social work and other areas, and they said, we, you know, we've been told, you know, everything we need to do needs to be national. I said, here's how you become national. You wanna be an expert at something, be good at home. So if, 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 you, if you are an elite researcher about and contributing to the life of people here in South Carolina in such a way that it's impactful here in South Carolina, people from other places will come and see how you do it. That's how you get to be world-class. You don't get to be world-class hopping on a plane, flying to Paris, talking about some work you did somewhere that nobody really cares about. You get to be world-class because you're so good, everybody comes to where you are to see what you're doing. That's what it means to be world class. Right. And I think people are confused about it because they want these first class tickets to fly somewhere. But the reality is you got to take care of home. And if you're not doing good work at home, I don't see how you can go anywhere else and add value. I, 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 I just don't get it. Not when you're the flagship. The flagship is about leading the way at home. And so I'm passionate about this. This gets me pumped up. I mean, this is what it's really about. And so I think on the education front, the health front, we should be crushing this thing on the health front. I mean, we've got health disparities here. Yep. We need to be a juggernaut in the area of health, adding value because health predicts education and education predicts health. And if we can work in that nexus and really make this work, and we can do an outstanding, we can change the future of so many generations right now. And that's, that's the investment we need to be doing, not just in research, but development, community development that's related to the research. Now, are you sure you're not president? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, man, just to be quite candid. You, you, you. I, am, I, am a, I am here as a partner, sir. Well, well we, are, we, are thrilled, we are thrilled that you're a partner. <laughs> no, and, and, you know, and, and, and you know, you asked a great question. And it's a good partnership. That's good. So we're very complimentary um, with different people. And, but, but, but very complimentary and I believe can be very effective together. This is not about egos and all of that. I mean, it's just really right. about right. what's his skill set, what's my skill set. Let's use this thing and, 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 and just do great things here for South Carolina. And that, that's what's exciting. It is very exciting. And I will tell you, I mean, I, I, again, I've had the pleasure to sit down with President Kaslin. I will tell you, he came into this position with some really bold leadership. Uh, and I think uh, that we all are very pleased thus far uh, with the direction of the university. I want to encourage all of our alums and, and guests to submit questions in the chat. We're going to get there in a couple of minutes. I want to do something real quick, uh, Dr. Tate, just kind of a rapid fire. There are three or four issues I just want to toss to you and just get your thoughts and, and, your, and, your, and your response. That sounds like uh, a <laughs> let's, We talked about COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, in the news, monuments, uh, 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 these buildings, Marion Sims, Strom Thurmond building, there have been protests. Your thoughts? Painful. Painful. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't say one word. You got to give me more than one word. <laughs> uh, well, no, I hear you. you know, I, I, I read three, I, 
told the faculty this at the faculty senate meeting. I, I finished three histories of South Carolina in the last eight weeks. Um, I, you know, everybody talks about the strong, but I was actually reading about the other names on campus um, for the other buildings as well. I didn't know the history of these people. You know, they have obscure figures in national news, but they're right. deeply rooted in South, Car South Carolina um, mythology, because a lot of it is mythology. Um, and uh, I was stunned um, by some of the things that uh, some of the individuals are attributed to saying and, and have been participating in and, and being honored. Um, there is a commission on this particular matter. I've tried to be, res I'm trying to be respectful. I'm going to be respectful and disciplined because discipline is a form of genius um, about what I say, um, because the commission is going through a process very similar to what I did to educate myself. They're educating themselves on these names and they are charged with uh, bringing some recommendations to the president. I said this to the faculty senate, I'll say it to you, um, our motto, broadly uh, framed is learning humanizes character and does not allow it, to, it does not allow it to be cruel. My hope is that the recommendations that come forward uh, are completely aligned with the motto and, and the traditions of this institution is something that we need to uh, take very seriously. So yeah, painful for me and um, I'm hopeful that the, the motto will manifest itself. Good. Uh, I think I saw a headline in the, the Daily Gamecock, uh, South Carolina Athletics projected revenue drops $58 million. Uh, sports, football, athletics. Well, Ray hey. Thomas, I mean, you know, I mean, I feel for Ray and I feel for all of us because part of the South Carolina, the University of South Carolina experience is athletics from football to, you know, I saw Coach Staley was on, obviously, women's basketball. And, um, you know, um, it is just an economic reality. We're going to have to, we're going to have to do the best we can to try to try to try to keep that floating. Um, we, it's going to be tough, you know, we can only have about 20,000 people in the stands for football. I'm really hopeful, you know, that basketball season, when that comes around, we can get people in there and keep them safe. But the general, the revenue from football um, and the economic impact on the region, because you can't bring all the people to Columbia, is going to be pronounced. It's not just going to be that our internal economics is, is thrown off, but regionally, restaurants, hotels, et cetera, right. are going to be in great pain. And this is where the people, back to our community development conversation, the people who live here, who historically have benefited from that economic flow are are going to find themselves um you know in a bit of a pinch during the middle of a pandemic where it's already been difficult so it's a painful time and we've got to figure out as a state how to stabilize all of this um and, and keep people afloat during this very diff difficult time yeah and you know tangentially you know we're dealing with this from a business perspective across america we just did a re piece of research with metlife uh where we found that some 66 percent of black businesses are uh, concerned about permanently closing. There's a whole supply chain and ecosystem uh, that's built around these universities and in our community. Two more issues and Amber, I know we want to take some questions. Uh, national, state and local elections. Vote. <laughs> Number one, vote, vote, vote. Vote twice, I'm from Chicago. No, not twice. <laughs> Not twice, Dr. Tate, just once. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see it. <laughs> but you can vote in each election. Vote in your local yeah. election three times. Vote, you know, you can vote three times. I know that's what you meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vote in the local race, vote in the state race, vote in the national race. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, and I say this now, seriously, I'm an educator. I, I encourage um, everyone to, you know, educate yourself on, you know, what the candidates stand for and the like, and then, and, and then participate in voting and also um, be very attentive to um, some of the things that might manifest themselves that would cause uh, voter nullification and um, other strategies that might minimize um, people's representation in a democracy. You know, so I really wanna encourage those who have the time to volunteer to make sure these things are executed in a fair fashion across the spectrum and, um, and really just educate yourself. Um, 
we have it's 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 a it's a it's a very big election, you know, because not only I think people can understand better now um, what elect, elected officials do because we had to manage a pandemic. A lot of times you just say, oh, they're not doing anything. But now I think you you can really get a real sense of how important each level of government is. You know, here in the city, you know, where uh, we have an alum who's running the city. You know, I was able to see what Steve Benjamin was doing when I was in St. Louis. I felt comfortable coming to Columbia because of the leadership he was displaying. And so I think that's extremely important. You have to feel like you can go somewhere and, and, and be comfortable. You know, I know, so I'm be bipartisan with this. I, I met with the governor, you know, some people may not like the governor, I don't know. Um, but I can tell you what, he was very supportive of what we were trying to get done here at the university and investing in it so that we could be successful. That's so right. that was important. It, and, it, you know, um, I, I just, I lay it out there like that for you. Who you get to represent you is extremely important and uh, you need to understand what they value and then hopefully it lines up with your values. And, you know, if you win, um, you know, you win. Right. One final rapid round and then Amber will come to some questions and questions and answers. And obviously uh, not just as Americans, but as black men in America, uh, the murder of George Floyd, police brutality, Ahmaud Arbery, we can go on and on and on. Black Lives Matter. What does that mean to you? You know, I was in St. Louis the last 18 years and, um, you know, we, we were ground zero for Black Lives Matter um, in many respects, um, you know, with everything that happened in St. Louis. Um, it means the world to me, um, you know, being a young man growing up on the south side of Chicago, and uh, dealing with the police. Now I'll say it to you this way, um, you know, my, my, my Pony League baseball coach was a, a police officer. And I thought he was an ethical man, but he told me the real deal. You know, he took me down to the police station and showed me where they take people and said, you never hear anybody when they go behind those doors. You don't know what happens behind those doors. He was just up, he was just that real with me. And I don't think a lot of people get that. I mean, I was very fortunate that he said that to me. He said, I don't ever want you, I don't want you here. It's a dangerous place, things, bad things can happen. Now, I'm not saying that all police officers are bad. I just know that, um, that uh, what I've seen on tape and the like um, is, you know, it's jaw dropping. Like, can, can I just be real? Like, is this real? Like, is this stuff happening? Like, like it's stunning. And for me, back to even to the Rodney King scenario, you know, that's what really motivated me in my own research. I used to be stunned that people were interpreting every movement that Rodney King made being hit with a baton and whatever they were beating him with as, oh, he moved. Well, well yeah, you would too. You know, it, it, right. it's like no humans involved was the call out in LA you know, when they would call for Blacks. And, and it's just this mindset, unfortunately, that, that, that Blacks are not human. And I, I'm just gonna keep it real here. That, this mindset is a legitimate construct in the psychological literature. You know, I don't wanna get too deep on you all today, but you know, the neuroscientists have documented how difficult it is for people outside of certain racial groups to view other people as human, or even right. to see their pain. So it's not, you know, and a lot of people want to go in the blame game. It's, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm saying we're, we're hardwired in part to protect in groups and to ignore out groups. And you have to be socialized and it has to be worked through for you to actually have empathy for other people. And, and, and so I hear people saying things and I'm like, you, you're really, you, you for real hardwired. <laughs> so so, so I, I'm, I'm pained by it. I am, um, you know, I spent my whole career writing about opportunities for blacks in education and public health. So this is a both, this comes at the nexus of education and public health for me. And clearly lives are being, being lost. And clearly we need to be educating people in ways so that that stops. And um, I'm all in with it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a painful situation. Painful is not even, it's not even close, right. to be honest. You know, my grandfather grew up in Oxford, Mississippi. He talked to me about what that was like. 
man, this sound is this this stuff that we're seeing in real time, in many cases, seems more horrific than some of the things he described to me. Right. Right. Well, listen, I, you, you're right. I mean, you mean that that's another conversation which I would love to have with you any day. Uh, and we have to recognize, uh, you know, this this country was built on the premise of three fifths of a man. Uh, you know, you know, so we can't deny the structural inequality, inequalities and in the things we uh, see today. They are connected to our history and the construct of our country. Uh, Amber, let's have some questions. Dr. Tate, I want to say thank you for this chance to have a conversation with you. You have thousands of alums across America uh, who look like us, who want to be engaged and be supportive of, of the work that you're embarking on. And I hope that we'll continue not just that this dialogue, but find ways where we can all support and help you advance your agenda. So, so on that note, on that note, I want to encourage every alum who's listening to commit $18 in one cents a month, 1801. Y'all know about 1801 here. 1801 a month to a scholarship that's gonna support a black student. You won't even miss 1801 in your payroll deduction. You won't miss it. You if you do it, I, matter of fact, I'm gonna do it too. I, I'll make a commitment right now. 1801, if we got every black alum to do that, and commit to a black scholarship, we could change several, uh, a, a, a score of lives. Just like that. Just like that, you'd be 20 more people and boom, their lives are changed. And go. if you have more than 1801, just double it. Give me 3602. <laughs> Triple it. Doc, I'm waiting <laughs> on you to say, and you can cash up it now. <laughs> I'm not Ever. asking for me. I'm asking for the future I of love the black alumni associates. Well, what a great challenge. Amber, let's hear some, let's take some questions for Dr. Tate. Oh my gosh. So I'm just like overwhelmed with, I, I'm just, I'm just, it's just a privilege to even be here to hear this conversation. So thank you both so much. Um, first of all, how much time do you gentlemen have? Because we have several questions, both in the chat and also in the Q&A, and we do not have a time limit on this uh, Zoom webinar. So I want to try to prioritize these accordingly. So here's, here's what my mother taught me. You don't show up at somebody's house if you didn't have dinner beforehand. So <laughs> I have my dinner. I'm ready to rock and roll. You, you have me as long as you want. <laughs> but let, let, let's go. Let's go. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So uh, starting off, well, there were a couple of questions that came in during the discussion about uh, the enrollment. Um, there were some questions and notes about um, the Black enrollment for students being down and we talked about how that spiked back up a little bit and I put in the chat the latest article for more to read about that. Um, but one person uh, alumni in particular, I believe it was Pamela was uh, curious about overall people of color, not just black. Um, if you had any uh, additional insights on that. In the, in the first year class underrepresented minority as defined by the federal government was about 23% this year. So it was, it was, it, you know, it was higher than uh, that, um, the number the eight, the, I think I gave you a number of 8% for African Americans. It was 23% for underrepresented minorities as defined by the federal government. So that was a, a, a increase year over year from the prior year. I'd have to get you, and I don't want to make up anything um, on the fly. I'd have to get you more specifics about the current underrepresented uh, minorities in uh, undergraduate class. I can get that for you. Absolutely. You can post it if you like, if you know, I get it to you and if I send it to you, you can post yeah, it. Yeah, you could, you could put it in the chat. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, also, um, Ken Scarborough spoke and said that um, when he was on campus from 1981 to 85, the black student population was between 9 and 11 percent. Um, what can be attributed to the reduction? Um, it can be learned going forward to get closer to the strategic goal uh, that President Caslin set out. So we're at 9 percent now. So it's back to those 1981, 82 numbers. Um, what I would say, um, and by the way, he was in school. That was, so that was during the Reagan administration. Um, and then, so being political and keeping it real, that, that's when um, right after that, um, the number of African-Americans in college dropped in a precipitous fashion because 
Reagan uh, changed the financial aid requirements. He was elected um, in 1980. He went to 80, 84, the Reagan uh, revolution, on financial, the economic revolution, cut financial aid uh, in drastic form. So by 1988, when George Bush um, followed him, um, the federal financial aid was decimated. Um, that followed with um, a change to what I call the benefit principle of state government, where states began to say, um, they were going to begin defunding education at a slower rate. And after 2008, it even, even escalated even faster after that breakdown because they went to the benefit principle, which basically means he who benefits or she who benefits pays. In other words, they were no longer going to subsidize other people's children. You had to pay your own. And so it became a situation where you had to pay directly the tuition costs and they weren't gonna provide financial aid, the benefit principle of taxation. Um, so if we wanna to get to the question of how to keep from happening what happened after the 88 period, um, we have to invest in scholarships and financial aid. Um, let me be clear about something, folks, and I, I just wanna be as transparent as I can be. When I asked you about this 1808 giving, I'm not joking. Like we're gonna to have to subsidize our young people with our our generous giving while simultaneously lobbying the state for uh, releasing of funds that allow us to spend on our own money on scholarships. That's the only way to keep this momentum going. It's going to be individual giving and uh, working with the state government. The federal government's not going to increase financial aid right now. We're in, not in the middle of the pandemic. So it's twofold. So we, we've got momentum. We've just got to keep it going. Dr. Tate, let me add one piece of that and get your thoughts, because oftentimes when you hear what you just said, which is spot on, uh, there's a sort of a competing conversation about the continued the rise of tuition and cost to even attend colleges and universities. So, what, you know, someone may be thinking, well, well you know, how, how can the university drive down cost while simultaneously uh, trying to not, not just raise money from alums, but more support from not only state, but federal government. Is there an obligation on behalf of the university or have all the cost cutting that could be done, has that already been done? So let me, let, let me tell you about the University of South Carolina, sir. Um, from an efficiency point of view and a investment in terms of, you know, really cutting administrative costs, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. We're at bare bones. Um, it actually concerns me because I'm worried about deferred maintenance and many, many other things that we simply don't have the money to take care of a beautiful physical plant. And um, so we're at a very narrow cost parameter. We just presented to the trustees an analysis of where we are relative to other major research universities. We're at the very bottom in terms of how much, how much we expend on administrative costs. It's, it's actually elite in that front. But that also, the implication is that we don't have as much to expend on scholarships and or instructional costs. So we're, we, we've got this administrative cost thing down to a science, if you will, but we haven't been able to get a delta or an uptick on the other parts. So we've kept the cost parameters low it's relatively inexpensive to go to school here in state. Um, we haven't raised the tuition. Um, it's, it's, it's really been, um, I think, a very disciplined operation on that front, but it doesn't leave a lot of margin for us to invest in, in scholarships. Got it, got it, thank you. Amber? All right, so uh, Timothy asked, uh, well, he said on the subject of COVID-19 and the effects on the minority population as a whole, that's disproportionate in numbers. What efforts is the University of South Carolina taking to address this issue with minority students that are black and brown from an ethnicity perspective that may be more adversely affected in regards, um, maybe more adversely affected and um, to educate the student body population in this regards. Also, he says, congratulations, Dr. Tate on being selected our provost. Thank you. So, the, so it's interesting on the disparities related to COVID disease and race and ethnicity. Interesting is not a word you should use in the academy, but 
but but it's it's partly environmental and partly economic and less genetic we don't have genetic verifications yet those studies haven't happened so the question is a good one one of the things that the university has been talking about doing is to try to do some genetic related research to determine if there's some kind of genetic predisposition related to this particular virus specifically in there's some literature that suggests that people of African descent don't um, eliminate RNA related viruses at the same rate as others. But that's speculative at this point. What we know is that there are underlying health conditions with Blacks um, that cause them to have a significant death rates over and above others. And they also work in places that require them to be in front of a lot of people and in crowds that gives greater exposure. And on a housing front, which is extremely important, the housing tends to be, um, a, a, you know, where families are living together in closer quarters and don't have the same places to space out. So these are, these are really environmental and built issues that might be race specific and not necessarily genetic. And I think that we need to be careful about that. Um, but we do need to figure out if there's something about this virus that it, there's some kind of genetic piece to it, but that work hasn't been done yet. Uh, another question related to COVID, are there any plans to go uh, to virtual learning at the university um, because of the, we, we discussed this in the beginning of the, of the call, but um, in regards to the large number of students that have tested positive, I know you said only three ended up being hospitalized, but have, are there any discussions so far about uh, virtual learning instead of remaining on campus? Well, we have people in virtual learning and many of our classes can go virtual on a dime now because they are, you know, they're bimodal in the terms of how they're organized. Um, we plan every day to be open. However, we have a decision basing, you know, we have a matrix that provides information so that we can assess it over time. Um, but I, I, I want to say this, and I don't want to speak out of turn. You know, you heard uh, Fauci talk about this this past week. You know, about 65, maybe 70, 80 percent of the students on our campus live off campus, and they're in leases nine to 12 months. So going virtual does virtually nothing for us because those students aren't going home. They're going to be here. So I don't want to abdicate, and I don't think the president wants to abdicate our responsibility to our students and say, to Mayor Benjamin, hey, you take care of them. You know, we're going virtual. They're out in the apartments. They're on you now. We want to be there for our students. And so by staying open, it keeps all of our services flowing. It keeps everything in place for us to actually take care of the young people in our charge. And so I, I'm hopeful, as I said at the beginning, that um, even if the positive rate goes up, we maintain a quarantine and isolation capacity that allows us to stay open and that the local hospitals, um, their capacity remains very robust in case someone becomes seriously ill, that we know we have what we need in order to take care of the young people we're, we're charged with. Got it. All right, uh, we've got about 10 more questions. Um, Stacy is asking, what will the recruiting and admissions processes look like for current high school students? How will we ensure that there will be a strong class entering next fall? Well, you know things change because of the uh, because of the pandemic, and the we're test optional for the fall. So for this next coming class, so what's going to change is that some students didn't get access to taking the ACT or SAT, and we're going to have to base our admissions on um, how well they did in high school, their coursework, and recommendations, which we have a modeling framework to ascertain whether they can do the work or not. But the big difference this next year will be that uh, standardized testing won't be a requirement for admissions to the University of, of South Carolina. And um, that should be a very interesting to look and see what happens under those conditions. Uh, Frida McCray asks, uh, Dr. Tate, are you planning on visiting other campuses such as the School of Medicine and regional campuses? I will for sure be in Greenville because um, that dean, re, you know, is part of my reporting structure. Um, in terms of visiting other campuses in the system, I will always come if invited. <laughs> I don't want to overstep my welcome. I am the Columbia 
provost. I do work with the system in the sense of um, I'm on a committee system wide to you know sort of man help manage it. Uh, but but I'm I'm more than willing to visit any campus. I would love to come and see folks and 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 see what's happening across the state. I'm interested in the state, so I would imagine over the next year I will have made it to every campus. Dr. Tate, to that point, uh, because for, <laughs> I'm dating myself, for those of us who might have been at a university in the 80s and before, th the structure of the system is vastly different. Uh, and so when you say you don't, so explain to them that what responsibility do you have for those other campuses, whatever we call them now, because <laughs> uh, I get the incoming all the time from certain uh, of our system uh members of the family that there's no diversity there are issues where is that accountability uh how does that work with regards to your role as provost well fundamentally i'm i'm responsible for the columbia campus which is the flagship however um, many academic affairs related activities come through my office i don't catalyze them or initiate them i'm i'm, I'm more or less shepherding them through to to get to the trustees as sort of the representative for academic, academic affairs. Each one of those campuses has a campus chancellor who is responsible for those operations. And, and of course, President Kasdan is responsible for the totality of it all. Um, so I, I, I don't have a say so on who they hire or how they organize their planning. Each one of them has their own system chancellor. Got it, thank you. So this question is from Stephen uh, Nicholson. Uh, welcome, Dr. Tate. So glad to have you as a part of the U of SC community. I know with COVID-19 and person individual meetings have been challenging. Will, the, will there be additional opportunities either in groups or individually to meet with you, whether it be publicly or privately to interact and discuss our previous experiences as students and any suggestions or concerns we may have as black alumni? Well, we can arrange those things through the Alumni Association. I think that would be the optimal place so that more people can be engaged. Certainly during the COVID period, um, there's no reason we couldn't have chats and the like on Zoom or Teams or whatever folks want to use. And then once this is over, I would imagine there will be events um, that I would be more than happy to attend. Um, you know, individual, um, if you send me an email, uh, I, I I, I will respond, just know you're in a heap of about a thousand a day. Um, and, and you know, I, I do eventually try over the weekend to get to people and, you know, say I want to hear about it. And um, if you're really a special alum, you know, we probably could find a place to go to breakfast somewhere that's outside. Who knows? <laughs> it's safe and socially distant. Well, the good thing about the Black Alumni Council, I think Amber and her team are thinking about how we can continue on a peer, you know, peer, periodic basis, this type of dialogue, uh, so that uh, we can be respectful of your time and schedule, uh, Dr. Tate. Amber? Absolutely, we'd love to do that. And this was just the first step, right? This, yeah. this open conversation. So we're excited that uh, this is the first step down that path. I would love to take you up on that breakfast offer, but being out here in, in San Francisco, I'm a little far away, but uh, he also accepts LinkedIn requests. So uh, if you would like to connect with him on LinkedIn, that's an, another great place to network. And and, 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 I, and I respond to LinkedIn messages always. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, um, so Julian asks a question for Dr. Tate. As a former student athlete, how were you able to successfully transition into life after sports? What made you get into education? Really good question. So um, I, I, I had an experience. I was thinking about this um, actually. Um, you know, I'd be very personal. I was driving between here and um, going back to see my family in St. Louis and somewhere in Tennessee, um, there's a monument or a big flag, a big Confederate flag um, flying out on I-40 or something like that. And uh, I looked at it and it reminded me of um, when I was in high school. And um, I share this experience because um, it was a painful one. Um, in Chicago, it's a deeply de segregated city. I don't think people really understand. Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in the United States of America, more so than even the Deep South. And um, 
in high school, uh, I was playing Pony League with that coach I told you about, the police officer, having a tremendous baseball season in the summer league. Batting, I, I, you, you know, people who say they don't remember the ACT scores, they're lying. So I remember my batting average was like about 430. You know, I was leading the team of home runs, triples, having a really good summer league. And um, it was time to play varsity um, baseball. And so I went to the baseball coach and said, um, you know, I'm ready to put, try for the varsity team. He said, I know, yeah. He said, fine, you're going to have to come here and play at Marquette Park in the summer. Now, Marquette Park at the time um, was, uh, you, you, you just, there was, you couldn't have access to it if you were black. And um, it was largely uh, a stronghold of, uh, of neo-Nazis. And um, I said, I can't get there. I can't even have my mother bring me to that. I mean, I, I was like, you know, just. And so it was at that point, my father said something to me. And it was about sports. He said, I know you love it. He said, it's in, it's, you love it. He's like, but at some point, man, you're going to have to put that stuff down and get with this program that you're dealing with right now. <laughs> he said, just what happened to you has been happening for a long time. And so it drove my research. It drove everything about who I am. And um, so the whole opportunity framework you see for me is real because I understand what it means not to have it. And uh, it started for me initially in sports and something very innocent that everybody says, oh, everybody has access to it. That's just not true. And so um, that's what got me motivated in the academic side because I, I knew eventually it would come to an end. But by the way, there's a positive side. That's when I picked up basketball, which I had never played really seriously before. But I found in Chicago, you could go anywhere and play. And that, that's, that changed my life, really. And, um, but but, that, but that, was the, that was the thinking for me on where it, it all changed. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Sort of on that note, Todd asks, uh, he says, I think given South Carolina's role in the enslavement of Black people, Jim Crow, et cetera, that our university has a responsibility to educate people in our current times, both students and the general public, about this history. It seems to me that as we enter discussions about renaming buildings and the media attention that it will draw, this might be an opportunity to move that education um, even beyond the individuals whose names bring the controversy, controversy, excuse me. Any thoughts on that? It would be great to see South Carolina as a state and U of SC leading the country in this area. I, I know there are some areas, uh, I know my colleague Julian uh, Williams, who's uh, you know, uh, heading our diversity and inclusion is working on things, but let me give you an example of if you're diligent and you're thoughtful, how you can make exactly happen what happened. I see some people are saying you should read the color of law in, 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 in. So there's a law in, on the books here in South Carolina that you know, you're supposed to teach the Constitution. You have to take a year of the Constitution. Um, and we've been working on trying to figure that out. But the state legislative body, in, in their wisdom, has broadened that to include um, founding documents um, over and above the Constitution. And they've also said that the, the groups that can teach the class are um, political science, history, and African and African American studies. And this would be a requirement. So imagine if these groups were teaching these documents with a, appropriate historical framing and contextualization of what was really happening during these times and the decisions that were being made as, as Rick laid out about the three bits compromise and you know, laying out how did all that happen and why did those, ha why did those things happen? Um, I think that would really greatly improve um, that would greatly improve our uh, colleagues who matriculate here a real true understanding of, of this country and its opportunities. And so I, I think that we, we can pull that off and make that happen here. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful. I live in, in a world of hope, but I also live in a world of execution. So hopefully over the next uh, semester, we can get that instantiated into the curriculum here. And that will be another great opportunity for students to grow and learn as that, as that commentator uh, talked about. For sure, yeah, I remember just sitting, actually my uh, 
my university one on one one on one class back in 2004 was in Sims Hall. And so I'm um, just thinking back to that time and learning about the university. I can't recall learning any black history for the University of South Carolina. So that's a valid point. Um, another question from Tilda, and, you, and we kind of spoke on this already, but let me know if you'd like to add anything. Are, there, um, are you thinking about the admissions criteria that may hinder some black students opportunities? And just going back to our conversation about it being 100%, well, mostly financial. Um, anything else you wanna to add to that, uh, the comments shared earlier? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that there are, if we get, let's just go one class at a time. This, this particular class, people might say, it's standardized testing's gone, what, what does that mean? What it's gonna mean is that we've gotta find the students who matriculated in high schools, who took a rigorous curriculum and have a high chance, a probability of being successful here at the University of South Carolina. I think we can do that. So I, I, so I don't see for this particular year any impediments to that. Once the students get here, um, we've got to provide a, a platform for them to be successful. And the key year is the first year. Um, students who matriculate the first year and have a great experience tend to, to finish. And why is that important? Because the most expensive education that you can have is the one that you don't, you, when you don't finish. It's expensive in that you didn't finish it and it's expensive that you potentially might've gone into a tad bit of debt to get it. So we've got to make sure people finish once they get here. But I think from an admissions point of view, um, we've got a good strategy and model in place. I just want to make sure people uh, matriculate and finish. Absolutely. Um, this is a short but heavy question. How do you feel about defunding the police, Pamela asked. <laughs> Well, I, I don't do research in that particular area. Um, I, I do think that uh, I understand what people are saying. Um, I'm big into reallocation. Um, and I think that there are some potentially opportunities in municipal government for reallocation. From the area I study was St. Louis. Now, I will say this um, about the metropolitan St. Louis area. I don't know South Carolina as well. But a preponderance of the individuals in Northern St. Louis, that were, which is largely black, those city governments were generating their revenue from tickets and citations at a rate that was 60 or 70%, some of them as, as high as 80% from um, the individuals in those communities. So they were using a policing function to fund the municipal government. Now, I will say this with certitude and without hesitation, because I've already written two papers on this matter, maybe three, that that is an unethical practice and one in which creates tremendous dis, uh, just tension between the police and the community because the police are charged to generate revenue to run the municipality by giving tickets for lawns, speeding, et cetera. It's just a nightmare. And uh, I, I know this community very well and have studied it for 18 years. So I could say in certitude in that area that we need to change the arrangement of how we fund municipalities. And if we don't do that, then it will lead to great harm to the people who live there. Dr. Tate, I'll add, that's a great example again of how uh, not just you, but the other rich research uh, that's coming from faculty, how do we move that and coming from my policy background and infuse that knowledge into public policy? And so maybe at, at some point, you know, thinking through, you know, how do you take a university system and create a, a, a stronger collaboration with the South Carolina Black Caucus, for example, at the State House or at, at, with the mayors? Because there's so much knowledge and research uh, and that could help affect policy. But I'm glad you cited that as an example because there's so many other areas that there could be some collaboration. Well, let me say this, sir, that um, I would be deeply committed to work with you and any others who would like to create such a organ in this state to add value using empirical evidence to inform um, policies, practices, regulatory functions and the like related to the advancement of uh, black lives, and uh, any other life uh, that thinks that it's at risk. Because fundamentally, 
Um, you know, we, we are at a time now where this disconnect between the research policy and practice is dangerous. Yeah. And, you know, um, we've got to find a way to bridge this particular gap and um, really, um, uh, really be transparent about the research while also uh, holding uh, folks accountable like myself and others who work in the public sector. We, we need to be held accountable. Um, I, I can't be reckless. I mean, people bring evidence to me, I have to use it. And I think all of us who work in these administrative posts who are policy implementers um, need to be held accountable in that regard. And so I, I, I'm, I'm very open to it. I know that they've tried to do that down at uh, UT Austin, tried to create a bridge or has created a bridge between um, the state uh, legislative body and the University of Texas to, to pipeline uh, data and information, a center that translates research to, to uh, policy and programs and then also feeds back to the researchers where policy and programmatic evaluation information comes to researchers so they can feed it back into the system is something that is desperately needed and I think we should give it a go. I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how exciting that would be. Well, I have some thoughts and we'll certainly be back in touch. I'm in on that one. Amber, you got another question? Yes, for sure. So, uh, um, Ms. Steedley asks, what are your thoughts on the university community relationships as it relates to Carolina and the city of Columbia? You spoke a little bit about how uh, Mayor Benjamin, also an alumni, made you feel comfortable coming to South Carolina and coming to Columbia. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the relationship between the two? Well, the, they are the same. Um, you know, the, the university is embedded. You know, I'm a geospatial person. You were talking about geospatial. The first law of geography, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related. So, every, so the university is embedded in a ecology called a community called Columbia, called Richland County, called the state of South Carolina. And these ecologies are rich with tradition and, and with all kinds of folkways and the like. And it's this elixir that comes together when it's working well is what, add, what adds value to people's lives. Our job as uh, citizens and residents of these communities are to um, help stir that elixir to create the, the optimal scenarios so people can flourish. And um, there really is no other charge. Um, th that is our fundamental charge. And you know, I'll be biblical here, you know, because all my papers are biblical. The, and, I, and, I, and for those who say I'm not separate, there's a separation between religion and university. So let me help you all understand something. Every single ology you study, sociology, psychology, anthropology, all ask the same fundamental biblical question, who is my neighbor? Not a single one of them is divorced from that question. The difference is in theology, we answer the question, but we also have an obligation to act. In the other ologies, we just answer the question. There is no obligation to act. What I'm basically saying is that, if, based upon what you're saying, is that if we're gonna be in community together and we learn all of these things, why don't we act? I mean, it, it, just, it just doesn't make sense to, to learn what I talked to you about. And as somebody I saw said, we shouldn't defund the police department. I wanna say, I never said that. I said, from my research, see, see Rick, this is the problem when research is getting involved. I said from my research that the police in the municipalities I study use policing techniques to generate a large majority of the revenue to fund the municipality, thus creating a tension between the police and its citizens. This is something that should stop. Is that clear? Now, how do we stop it? That's Rick, where we could get together with a, a community group and or this research organ and come up with strategies right. so that we can be clear about how we can add value in this way. That, that, that's what this should really be about. I and mean, we, if we're cooking like that, it's like four or five years from now, we have that kind of thing going here. We will be elite global and everybody will be coming here to see how we're doing. That's powerful. Good. Thank, thank you, Reverend Dr. William Tate. <laughs> I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to go theological on you, but you know. But no, I, but I, I love I, it, man. I get frustrated when people 
don't understand that like oh, yeah. every yeah. single question is is who is my neighbor? You That's what is right. sociology about? What is anthropology right. about? Right. What is psychology about? Come right. on. There we go. All right, Ham. What, what right. else? Yeah. Kimberly says, thank you for your time, Dr. Tate. How um, have you spoken with other provosts, your equal at other college campuses in the state? Is there some sort of uh, cohort or place for uh, collegiate COVID responses? Um, is there a type of cohort in place for collegiate COVID, respo COVID responses? And um, I guess examples like Clemson University, uh, Coastal Carolina, College of Charleston, other, other conversations you've had with your equals at other universities within the state. So yeah, there is a group um, that they, I think they meet regularly, but I, we're on Zoom now. I, I, I met with them for the first time a few weeks ago. And then um, there's another set of groups, provosts all around the country who've been meeting about COVID or budgets. So there are networks of individual provosts who get together and have conversations. This state is interesting in that it's, 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 there's a lot of competition against, you know, because of sports here. So, you know, I, you know, imagine um, if I came on the Zoom and I was on here with the Clemson provost, you all wouldn't be real happy. Like, see, people got an attitude that I, if I could have everybody's picture, people would like, what? So, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, I don't think there's a whole lot of engagement in that way. Um, but, I mean, if we needed to, I'm sure we could work it out. All right, I'm being told we have time for two more questions and that's fine because actually we just have two remaining. Um, uh, Vita, Vita asked in the chat, uh, what is the pl your plan uh, or the university's plan that is for hiring more black faculty at the University of South Carolina, more specifically in STEM? And I know you spoke earlier about how black faculty and staff doesn't just benefit black students, uh, it, it benefits all students. So um, if there's a specific plan for that, could you share that with the group? Well, each of the individual deans are, are working on that right now. In fact, um, I don't want to mention the school, but one is a STEM field, and they, they just sent me a great candidate, an African-American female candidate from an Ivy League institution who's very interested in coming here. And the key, we have to, we have to provide ample resources so they can be successful here. But overall, in our strategic planning process and, um, that just was approved by the trustees, um, there have been a set of resources that have been placed um, in my office and in some of the schools so that we can do a better job of recruiting and retaining. Retention is also important because we don't want to lose uh, outstanding people either. So um, the, the key will be in each um, school's planning function, my job is to leverage with money. I'm just being real how this really works. <laughs> my job is to leverage with money uh, their efforts to hire people and um, they have to take their resources and I add mine. And then we go after, uh, you know, the individuals who have been identified either through a committee or recommended to us from other folks. But I think we're going to have to do some other things. Um, one, of the, one of the things I would like to get done is I think we have to do a better job of recruiting PhD students who we then can, can, who we can, can convince to stay. So we get them here. And then we prepare them, and then we ask them to make a commitment to us for X number of years afterwards to launch their careers, and they can stay long term or they, they can transition off if they want to go into the free market. But I think that's something we, we're going to have to work on. And in fact, um, in the graduate function over the next six months, I'm going to, I'm going to make some moves to make that happen. So um, I'm hopeful that we can build our own and, and develop our own here, people who want to be here. And, committed to being here. That's excellent. Um, Rick, before I ask the last question, do you have any other thoughts or questions you want to share with Dr. Tate? No, listen, I, my, just a final statement that this has been extremely uh, encouraging. Uh, but listen, Dr. Tate challenged us as well as Black alumni, those of us who uh, uh, have, are stakeholders in the university. And I think we should take him seriously about his challenge, the 1801. Uh, to give back, and, and, and not only in terms of our finances and investment, but to be a part of this conversation and dialogue and help him uh, advance the agenda that he's working on every day at the university. Uh, Amber, thank you again for convening uh, this great dialogue, 
And, you know, after dialogue and conversation, it's time for action. And that's what we need to engage in as well. So I look forward uh, to doing my part uh, to help move our university forward, not just for sake of the university, but for the sake of our community and our people across South Carolina uh, and America. Absolutely. And, and really, that was the last question. How can Black alumni support your efforts, Dr. Tate? And I think uh, the clear answer is it's not just your efforts. It's all of our efforts to, to want to um, bring more Black students in, help retain them, help them graduate. And you spoke a lot about uh, how we can contribute to Richard T. Greener scholarship. Um, I put the link in the chat and I can do so again. Um, every dollar counts. But um, more than just dollars, how can Black alumni support you? How can Black alumni support these efforts that you discussed today? Well, I think the conversation that Rick and I went on about creating um, a framework to build a bridge between research and what happens in sort of the governance functions of the state. Um, if we had support and people were calling for that, um, let me explain to you what that would do succinctly. Um, we would be a national model and um, black students would want to come here to matriculate because to just see that in action would be quite powerful. Um, and, and so I, I think that that is an area in which people can support um, just vocally providing encouragement, saying those are the kinds of things can happen. Anything can happen um, in, at the University of South Carolina and people so desire it and we work hard to make it happen. And so I just, I just really believe we should give it a go and, and, and I think it would make a huge difference. Um, we're gonna come off with the commission report soon we need to leverage and, and, and really build some strength from that. And, and, and I hope we can do that. Outstanding. Any other closing thoughts, Rick? Or Dr. Tate for the group? No, let's go get it done. I mean, let's, let's make it happen. I appreciate let's make it. it happen. Now, now is the time. The urgency is now. Let's get it done. Awesome. Well, thank you all. There were over, well over 100 people that joined us tonight. Um, we're so excited. Uh, to support you, Dr. Tate. Um, honestly, it was, again, it was a privilege for me to just be on the same stage as you and, and, and Rick, um, a, a, another outstanding alum. Um, we we're, we're really appreciate y'all just taking an hour and a half of your time this evening to talk directly to Black alumni at the uh, of the University of South Carolina. Um, for those that are asking about how you can get more involved, um, please uh, interact with us on social media. Uh, you can learn more about uh, BAC um, at um, the university's um, alumni page that I've also uh, tagged and then we tagged all of their, uh, the social media pages in the chat also. If you have any questions or suggestions or feedback directly about this program, our new Black Leadership Series that we're hosting, uh, feel free to reach out directly to me on LinkedIn. Um, my email address I'm happy to share with you, amber.guyton at gmail. Um, myself and Tim, we are both over the BAC Alumni Engagement Council, and we would love to hear your ideas, especially uh, in this uh, ecosystem right now, this environment where people are Zoomed out and, and there's a lot of virtual learning, and we know that there are going to be some challenges ahead. Uh, homecoming events we have coming up will be virtual as well, uh, but we wanna hear from you, and we want to continue to create uh, very um, powerful content uh, that uh, will bring you in and, and that you'd be interested in. So feel free to share that feedback. Again, uh, Rick Wade, Dr. Tate, thank you so much for your time this evening and thank you everyone for joining us. Go Gamecocks. Thank you, go Gamecocks.